In the year to September 2019, the number of convictions or cautions for carrying a knife or offensive weapons in Nottinghamshire reached a record high. More offenders were being brought before the courts and the criminal justice system dealt with 690 cases, nearly two per day, making it the highest number of convictions since records began in 2009. This film captures the real life stories and experiences of young people and communities affected by knife crime, the causes behind the symptoms and the frontline work taking place across Nottinghamshire to tackle all serious youth violence. I read things that I read like not in the post like every day and I read the comments people write like when someone's been stabbed or someone's been arrested for carrying a knife and I see people comment like oh he's just a thug grit but there's so much more to it. Like this person might go home to nothing. They don't have a supportive family to show them. They don't have a hot meal on their plate. There's so much more. Like, you don't know. You don't. Know, you, you don't know if you might be having dinner at home. Who knows? I know certain lads won't even get a, a meal when they get home. They're, they're starving. They go to school and they rub packed lunches or whatever. And when you see people in your community, people who are either selling drugs or active doing certain crimes and they're driving around in big cars, they've got nice clothes, and you then decide, no, man, what? He's making 500 pounds in two hours. Like, you wanna make 500 pounds in two hours. When your mum and dad are struggling for money and stuff, you see other people on the estate who are getting money and buy drug dealing, and other crimes and stuff like that, then you obviously see that and you think, oh, I can be earning that money, and I can give my mum and dad money to pay the bills and stuff like that, and then, oh, I can get clothes for myself, I can put food on the table. All the people, like, people that trap and stuff like that. Like, they target young people because, you know, like, sometimes they're vulnerable and stuff. I just think people have to look at it with a bit more of an open mind and understand what the build-up is to that. Because it's not, you don't just wake up and just carry a knife. You, there's reasons to why you do that. Um, you know, when it comes to grooming, I was picked up uh, very young and I was told that I had to forget the lifestyle and the life I had before. Family and friends, believing everyone in my circle was my family, everyone in my circle was my friend. Trauma's there but no one's dealing with it. So then, then they get this thing that they are fearful that, that, that they don't want that to happen to them. So they will carry knives, not because they're part of a gang, it's just that they're so frightened. I can only just imagine how scared the young people are who are living through this and seeing their friends and family members being killed on our streets. You turn to a blade because it's the quickest thing for protection. Cops are not going to come in five minutes. Now you're literally thinking, am I going to be breathing in a minute? Or is my mum going to be burying me? or am I going to be surviving for the next week? It is that real. So the knife crime team has been created in Nottinghamshire due to the high rise in knife crime offences. Um, it's a specific team to target that, to tackle that, to target the offenders involved in knife crime. Um, I mean, all, throughout England, knife crime has risen over the last few years. You just see it from a young age, so you think it's normal. Like, you see all your mates and stuff going round, and then you see, like, your older family members, your cousins and stuff like that, so you just think it's normal. You just think it's the day-to-day -day life, pretty much. For any type of estate around the main city, um, it is quite rough. Um, you can't avoid it. It's just life. You go around the corner, someone's getting mugged. Or you go around the other corner, someone's been stabbed. You go around the other corner, someone's been robbed. It was just normal. And then you just get into the cycle of doing that, coming out, doing the same thing, going back in and stuff like that. Like my cousin, he got sent down on my brother's birthday. He got sent down for two years and that's good behaviour for our robbery. Then my other mate, he got sent down for five years, nine months for attempted murder, county lines and stuff like that. So yeah, it was impacting my mate is from County, my other mate, he was from City who got sent down for attempted murder. My cousin, he's from County as well, so. No, I think it's the same in every area. Like, you always get that one group that are bad in each area, and you always get, like, trap passes in every area and stuff like that. So it's literally just the same. There's incidents all the time, you know, but we know there's an increase of young Pakistani young kids now selling drugs. Take dependent on drugs. Uh, there's a trend, you know. There's a lot of unreported violence. Violence, you know, from the stats we have are nowhere near 
of what the crimes are going on out there. You know, and there's what well, the many barriers for that. One is you don't snitch. You know, snitches get stitches. Yeah. So how many incidents go unreported? The reality is, <clears throat> you know, what's the reason people are carrying knives? I think it's a, it's a number of small things which have kind of come together and end up being this real complicated sort of set of affairs which lead up to someone carrying a knife, and it probably starts quite early in the life. Nottinghamshire Police say that one reason for the increase in convictions is the creation of a dedicated knife crime team working across the city and county to tackle criminal activities that are also associated with violence. Whilst not all violent crime is drug or gang related, it's no secret that there is a clear link between criminal activity such as drug dealing, organised crime and carrying knives. Many young people say they carry knives for protection and many criminals are finding new ways to hide weapons from officers on patrol. County lines or cuckooing has become a widespread issue up and down the country and Nottinghamshire is no exception. I've been told to myself, it's like an older person come, start flashing a bit of money and then start doing stuff, start going out, robbing stuff and then ended up getting first charges just like, obviously, when you're starting, it just feels like something that's wrong. And then, obviously, when you start doing it more, it just comes like standard, just comes like day-to-day -day thing. Just like, just what you do. Uh, most, most reason why kids do get into drug dealing is because they're offered, especially at a young age, you're offered like 80 to 150, 200 pound a day in county lines, or even just staying in the area to where about your home every night, you're offered 100 pound a day and stuff like that. A lot of this then has now led to issues within the county and, you know, there's still the same, some of the same issues within the city that are in the county. So when we talk about deprivation, you know, there's lots of that in the county as well. Young people who haven't got access to money and live in really low income families. So that is a problem because potentially more likely to be influenced to, to make money other ways and get influenced or exploited. Because my uncle, he caught me on the train going uh, county lines and rang up my dad. And then that's pretty much how I got caught. But it puts more stress on you because then you see your dad and your mum and stuff getting stressed. Like I went to the shop, came back and my dad was on the floor crying and stuff like that. So it does put more stress on you. It makes you think, what am I doing to my family? Everyone was scared for my safety and stuff like that. So it's not nice when you get taught as a young person. You I was thinking, oh, just like a little bit of money, like just easy cash in it. And then when obviously I stopped doing it all, I just realised how better it was for myself and not for my family and stuff. I've been in the park with like 15 people at one day. Inside, I still feel like I'm by myself, you get me like. So after a bit, when it comes like a moment for I'm still on the road, it's like, yeah, I just want to go here yeah, and chill with my car, because I've got a still like, and call me there, and I've got a bit of day room. Like, for me, it's got to the point where I went to go home, but man can't tell anyone, in it. Because in the end, up drug dealing is like a big business. But the only people who do well in drug dealing are the people at the very, very top, and even they get caught eventually, so no one does well in it. It's frustrating the na naivety around it. They're, they're pretty much sold a dream at the beginning, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, they're shown by the older, more experienced drug dealer who's not getting hands on anymore, but he's supplying the younger dealers mm -hmm. the, the nice cars, the watches, the clothing, the designer clothing, things like this. That, that's what they're sold. That's what it's, it's easy money, come and do it, whatever. Um, when realistically, these young people at 14, 15, they're, they're the most vulnerable. Um, they are being exploited. They don't see it at the time. Um, and they're the ones that are running all the risks, aren't they? They're the ones on the street doing it, likely to be caught. Mr. Big and his Audi around the corner, who's running these young lads, he's not hands-on, he's not gonna get caught. The risk has gone from him. Especially if you're selling the stuff with an older and then you come back to them and say, oh no, I don't want to reload and stuff like that. Then they're going to start getting angry and stuff like that. And in some occasions they'll threaten to do stuff to your windows and like family members and stuff like that. Or they'll even put money on your head.
Young women, girls and teenagers as young as 11 are being targeted by organised criminal groups, a new and disturbing strategy being used to evade the police. Girls are actually being drawn into this as well. Girls are used and abused, they're used for sex, they're used to carry guns and knives and that kind of stuff. There's been cases where there's been things called honey traps. So that's when a girl will lure, lure a guy to a place and then the other side will attack the guy. And it's just important to understand that, like I said before, young people don't want to do these things. A lot of girls will send a picture of their, say, top off and think it's OK because that person isn't in the room. And then it might go on somewhere else. And then you've got the music too, which is very derogatory around women. A lot of girls are in a group, which they can call their family. And for a lot of girls, they don't understand that they're being sexually exploited. A young female Pakistani girl uh, hacked in, accounts hacked in, you know, images, um, um, things have been put up so on her, on her uh, Instagram page or whatever. And so, so that's... And that's, that was unreported, you know, because of family honour, shame. I guess the exploitation will be, it's in different types of exploitation. You know, we just mentioned young Pakistani girls cuckooing out in Derbyshire or wherever. In little villages, they'll find a spot, take them there, ice, you know, give them the drugs or whatever. And um, that's, 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 that's the business model of the criminal. The job Ken was talking about with the four people in the car, the female was the driver, she was driving the young uh, males round who had the knife. So it's it's definitely a tactic that used, um, again, with drugs. Um, they, they see it as um, they're less likely to get stopped and less likely to be arrested for it. It's social media itself as well, how because everything's shown on like Instagram, Snapchat, someone living this life, someone living that life, or oh, I'm flying on a jet, or oh, I've just got the new Moncler coat or new designer shoes. And they're thinking, why is it not me? Why can't I have that? And then they look at the, the easier ways of getting it, try and cut corners in life. And obviously when you cut corners in life, it's never legit. It's always dodgy or it's always, you know, it's always the bad stuff. So they always try and, you're always trying to figure out the easiest and quickest way to become that person on the picture, but what they're not realising is it's not real. The pressure to live up to the status, I think that is one of a major problem. The, the all living up to a certain perception to their friends and to the picture that they portray on the social media. So I think that's massive. And the what did you call it? Uh, Master D sensitise. That is that is one thing that we've definitely seen, and it's just like whoa, like. It's just another thing because it's happening so regular. They just there's no feeling towards it, so it's just second nature now, and they just become normal to it. So we have to try some way to just try and pull that back. Um, Nottingham is is a prime example of what it's like when you live in such a, a small and close knit community. Um, you know everyone, and when someone stabbed, you know the person that stabbed them. Um, when someone's been beaten up and it's on going viral on social media, you probably know the area, you probably know who lives around that area. Um, so it feels as though you can't really escape. Now it's like you can post anything on social media and in seconds somebody can see it, feel like you're sending shade towards them or something. They can interpret how they want to and that's it. Drama, beef. Next thing you know, somebody's being stabbed and is dead. Information is easily accessible now. You know, literally you've got everything on your phone every single thing on your phone and when you've got these influences I can't we can't control that you know there's only a certain amount of things that as a parent well, we find that our parents can control and when you when you've got people that, when you haven't got positive role models in social media and you've got young people who want to have that lifestyle um, that's where some of the problems start certainly when I started this role just over two and a half years ago um, it initially started working with 13 plus and as time went on we could just see that you know we were getting referrals from social care from other services for 12 year olds then 11 year olds then now we're down to eight years old because unfortunately due to things like social media due to things like older siblings being involved in crime it's very easy for younger people to be influenced by older people and what they see in the media you can put it into their head what what they're meant to do and they're just get used to it and then when they're like 16 and stuff they've already been in prison they come back out and they just want to do it again because that's all what they know.
you know, if someone's killed your brother, how do you put it down? Do you know what I mean? As adults, as a, you know, if that's happening in, in any of our lives, you're going to grieve, you're going to feel these things. And like Mike said, there's not that, a lot of the time, that support that they need to, to come out the other side. So, you know, retaliation, anger, anxiety, even walking the streets, not knowing. The, the, the kids are suffering. A lot of the kids are suffering, that's what it is. Following a number of fatal incidents, residents across Nottinghamshire showed concern that the city had a knife crime problem that had spread wider than gang rivalry. We spoke to Jason, whose name has been changed. Three years ago, Jason was violently attacked by a group of friends after refusing to become part of a so-called gang. We also spoke to the mother of Danny Parekh, who in 2012 was murdered in a park after walking home a female friend. If you are stabbed in the wrong part of your body, and that's one of a dozen different places, you've got a very good chance of dying. If you get hit somewhere else, you've got a chance of having major surgery that may keep you in hospital for months. You may lose bowel, you may end up with a bag on the surface, you may end up with drains, and a whole different life to the one you were expecting. See, a lot of people think about the person, the, the main people involved, so the person that committed the crime and the person that was a victim of the crime. Um, hardly ever think about the people on the outside. The victim's life's been destroyed, the family's been destroyed, their own lives, the perpetrator, uh, has been destroyed and, and because of what was a senseless action. Um, I lost someone who died in my arms and to me that was like, that was enough because that's a trauma within myself I still deal with day to day. So I got a phone call off a friend to say, meet me, meet me here and um, when I met that person, he was with two other people. One person had a, one person had a sawed-off shotgun, and um, the other two were just there, were just there, were just there for like pre just presence, I suppose, just intimidated presence. They rang me and about, oh, you violated the gang. Um, we want your chain. And we want money. The other, one of them that was there just took it upon themselves to stab me. So I've stabbed once in the um, abdominal area. It's like it, ha it happened so fast. It happened so fast, and um, yeah, when it was happening. I just felt like I was going to go. I felt like I was going to go. I am Lisa Buckingham and oh, his name was Danny Parekh, his mum. Um, Danny was murdered um, in 2012 by a knife crime. He was stabbed 16 times. Um, he was my first child. Yeah. Um, he was at home. One guy had come up with a pizza delivery guy and shouted um, that Danny had been stabbed on the park. I tried to stop the ambulance because they were trying to pull off and I was like, I need to get in there, that's my son, I need to get in there. I was at Queen's Medical, I was outside um, at a and &E. I was outside to the resuscitation part, they wouldn't let me in there. I was there from half past one, at ten past two the, the policeman says, um, they start to want someone to give you an update on Danny. And he opened this door to this room and I seen a coffee table with some tissues and I says to him, I'm not going in there. And he sat down. I was, I was like sat here and he sat to the side and he looked at me and he says, Danny's dead. It was like, an, it's just like, it was like a nightmare. Like I was in shock, I just didn't know. Because I didn't actually see him, it's like I still didn't believe it. I needed to see him and it's like, I felt numb. I felt like someone just put their hands in and ripped out everything inside of me. We work very hard to get people to, to live through the trauma of knife violence and the, the physical trauma and the psychological trauma that goes asso that's associated with it. But these are devastating, life-altering events and unfortunately a proportion of, of young people, they don't survive. I mean, we, want to, we want to take knives off the street, we want to catch people that are carrying knives because lives are ru uh, sorry, knives are ruining mm. lives. Do you know like you've got this area code thing as well, if you're from St Anne's you can't go into Meadows or you can't come into Raft or you can't go here and he just went everywhere, he just didn't care, like he would get on with everyone, everyone just loved him. And I think it, it, it's so sad that some kids get sucked up in that. But like on Danny's case, this wasn't the case where it was gang related or anything like that. And I just think how, and I just, I, I don't know how someone could just literally just stick a knife in someone. I hope that the youngsters realise the effect it has on families. Like when you take somebody's life, it, you're not just destroying, 
one person, you're destroying the whole family. And it, it, you remember that child's got a mum and dad. Nottinghamshire authorities have implemented a public health strategy that supports young people and families by addressing the underlying issues behind serious youth violence. To form it, went um, through High Street, Maitre. You'd be naive not to realise that there's a knock-on effect for using stop and search. There was a period of time where you couldn't read the news without it being about stop and search and the impact, the negative impact of it. Um, as a police officer, you know, and particularly on this team, you know, one of our main tactics is stop and search. We probably carry out more stop and search than any other team in Nottinghamshire Police. I think the kids should add in, hand in the knives, or if they knew, if they were specifically knew somebody of carried a knife, they should tell. Because you don't know who's going to get killed nowadays. So we are very, very proud with our association with Red Thread. We were the first trauma centre to get Red Thread outside of, outside of London and we've been working with them for the last two or three years. They do incredible work. Um, I think it's going to be easier to talk to a youth worker uh, if you're a young person and been the victim of violence than it is to a healthcare professional. So Red Thread work during what we call that teachable moment when there's an opportunity to engage with a young person to talk to them, to try and put in strategies to adjust their life, to adjust their, uh, what's going on around them, to try and stop them getting involved in further violence because what we know is there's an escalation of violence. If you're here once with an assault, you'll be here again with a more um, life-threatening injury and ultimately you've got a bigger chance of, of, of dying and we need to break that cycle and Red Thread and our association with, with them and the Major Trauma Centre is something we've been incredibly proud of and we will continue to work with them to try and improve the opportunities for our young people. You know, I spend so much time working with other youth and community groups because sometimes if, you know, we know, you know, there's no hiding from it, there is a lack of trust in the police amongst young people in certain communities. So working closely with partners, with a lot of the fantastic groups out there um, that have the trust of the local community, um, we can almost lean on them and work together to try and try and help some of these young people that might not listen to ourselves. So. My name's Cherry and I work for Remedy and we are based within Nottinghamshire Youth Justice Services and we contact victims of youth crime and we organise reparation within the county. Remedy, uh, we are contracted in to um, support victims of youth crime and offer them involvement in restorative justice. Um, and we also arrange uh, reparation for young people to ensure that it's creative and motivating um, and involves the victim if, if needs be as well. Last year, we were able to deliver our CEASE programme um, which looks at relationships and domestic abuse. Um, and that was available across Nottinghamshire last year, delivered to schools and young people within youth justice. Um, we were successful in applying to the VRU for some funding to deliver our county lines and exploitation programme. And that has been delivered since April within Nottinghamshire County and City. If you're trying to stop the, like, the violence, I think like try get more young people together and try to put like some on like where we're not all out on the streets or something like that. I think keeping, I know, I know they're tired from school, uh, from working and stuff, but it's still, where do you go? What do you do? That's a challenge in itself. So imagine if you didn't have a job, where do you go all day? <laughs> it's a big, big struggle. I think young people face boredom, uh, loneliness, um, yeah, there's nothing for them to do. Things like putting them youth provisions back in place, giving young people a place, a quality place that they want to go to, that they want to feel proud of, that they have these studios in where they can go and do, lay down a track and actually get that track out there, where they can learn about social media um, in, a, in, a, in a way that will benefit them, do you know what I mean, that will push their career and push what they're trying to do, instead of it always being a negative spin. Um, as we said, we do focus a lot on the early intervention, but yeah, if it is young people that are probably more hardened, more entrenched and more involved, that's definitely where we then try and do a lot more of that kind of joint partnership working um, because, you know, with the, with the other companies and organisations, credibility, that really does help us kind of get through to some of these young people indirectly. 
What we try and do is to prevent that peak, basically. Let's bring them back down again. You know, how can we get engaged with these students, with these um, children? How can we engage with their parents? How can we engage with the schools? And how can we make an impact using our cultural knowledge to make a difference and stop violence happening? You just have to try and plant a seed. Mm -hmm. I think that's all you can do. And then hopefully it will grow sometime. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but in a couple of years or whenever, I think. You just plant the seed. Mm. Just like if someone's flashing cash or someone like go tell someone like your mum or like a worker that you trust or even like another adult you trust or even the police. Like if you feel like you're at danger or like someone's like threatening you to like kill you or something then then obviously your safety isn't right and then that puts you under like serious pressure and then that's when obviously you need the help. So pretty much yeah, my yacht work and my social work and my family and my school, I just had like a tight group around me to help me stop what I was doing and stuff like that. So currently I'm a theatre producer, director, actor um, and um, drama facilitator. Um, my main job is at Theatre Royal Stratford East. My advice to a young person would be um, to find someone to talk to. Uh, that might not be somebody in your immediate circle. It might be uh, a youth worker. It might be the man from the gym, the man from the studio. But there is one person at least, it might be a f distant cousin. There is one person at least in a young person's life um, who will listen. So I'm a journalist. I am a producer and a reporter. My advice to any young person that feels any type of pressure um, to stay on the right track is to take every day as it comes and whatever situation you're in, it's, it's not forever. So I'm a DJ, I uh, say international DJ. Um, I've been everywhere you could probably ever imagine. The DJ, I've been Dubai, I've been to all the O2s, Manchester, Birmingham. I've been Cambridge, just, I've just been everywhere like, as a DJ. Since I've grown up, I've just realised to be a bit more selective with the people that I'm around and the choices that I'm making. Um, like back then, I'd probably go out, be out more for no reason. Whereas now, growing up, I've realised that if, I, if there's nothing actually for me to do constructive, constructively, then I might as well just stay at home and just spend my time at home with my family. I think at school I was unsure what, what success was. I always thought success was money, but it's not. <laughs> success is owning my own house now, paying a mortgage, you know, having a, a steady life where I don't have to work all hours of the day to try and collect this money <laughs> that people told me was success. But for myself, I've got a business partner, JCS. We uh, take on apprentices. We work with a lot of young people. We try and take on young people who have come from similar backgrounds as me and my business partner Adam, who have struggled with fitting into classrooms, especially fitting into schools. We try and work with young people who want to work as well and who might not have had the same opportunities as a lot of other children. I think what's difficult as well um, is perception because as young people, whether you're black, white, Asian, whatever colour, creed, wherever you come from, young people seem to address a certain way. They're viewed by the police in a certain light. So if you've got a black tracksuit on, or there, you're seen across the board as that. And I know young, young men who, who dress a certain way and they go to football training or, or they go into basketball, you know what I mean? Or they're going to do their A-levels, but they can get looked on in the street as like, you don't recognise it, but you, you're wearing a uniform almost what is in with that culture. So you get innocent people that's dragged into something that's not even in their remit, really. So it's difficult. You can't control, young people can't control how other young people perceive them, or how adults perceive them, or how the police perceive them, you know what I mean? It's just like you're all in one pool just trying to survive. It's not something that's gonna go away overnight, either, because it didn't, it didn't come overnight. So this has happened over, over years, generations and generations of getting to this point where we're at, where it's so, Raising to for these kind of things to happen, and then there's people who are in that world where, if I like Maxine said, friends who have been killed, 
Like for them as, as young people, have they even got the, the skill set yet for forgiveness? You might just get an innocent lad who's got nothing to do with anything because he's walking down a certain street with his hood up in a Nike, suit, uh, a Nike or something and it'll just retaliate in five seconds you're stabbed and you're dead. And it's sad because it is that quick and it is that easy to happen. But think about yourself in this type of situation. You're the only person that's going to feed yourself. No one else is going to feed you. They're always about themselves. That's the way it is and that's the way it is on the street. No matter how much you say you're repping the gang and you're, you're repping a certain postcode, oh, these are my brothers, these are my boys, oh, no, I'll die, ride and die for them. And in the day when it comes out, the blade comes out, I half them run, half them snitch on you in prison. That, that's reality because you're, at the end of the day, when you push to the corner, you think about yourself. You do. You think about your next surroundings. You don't. You don't think about your, your mate when you you're in the prison cell and you're facing 20, 21 years life for murder. You're not going to think about, oh yeah, I'm going to back my mate. Uh, I won't say nothing. I'll ride that 21 years. You'd be coming out what when you're 45, 40, 40. You know, it's <laughs> but lads don't get real. They don't realise it. Life is. It, it, this is real. This is a real thing. You can't. You can't go around thinking you're untouchable. You can't. You've got to get down to earth and think. Hang on, I need to get real. I need to actually just try and go on something legit. Because at the end of the day, everybody gets caught. Everybody gets caught. No matter who you are, cops will find you or your ops will find you. It is, it only ends one way. If you're doing this type of life, you might get a few years of lucky, you might go on holidays, you might look little fly, the girls might come running for you. But the girls ain't gonna stay with you when you've been stabbed in the hospital and you're bleeding out in your lung or your body's shutting down. The only person who's gonna be there is your mum. Yeah, your boys might put up a t-shirt saying uh, RIP to your boy, what you want to have your life and be ended up on a t-shirt at the end of the day. Nah, because at the end of the day, they'll forget about you in a week. They might go to your, more, your grave and put flowers down, but they'll be carrying on with their life. Your life is over. There is no easy way of this. This is reality. You got to get real. This is, this is the, real, the real deal. And if you don't get real, you end up dead or you end up in prison, because that is the only way out. You might get the odd, odd big top drug dealer or might make really massive success, but as we've seen already, they all get caught at the end of the day and they're all in life prison. They won't ever come out until they're like 80. What's the point of like, life's gone? You may just stay in and live the rest of your days out in there. But you literally just gotta get real. That, that is, that's my biggest, my biggest thing for them, yeah. And then I started up my own business and pretty much Everyone who was around me just told me, like, stop what I was doing and stuff like that. And then my school as well, because I don't go to a normal school, I'm on one to one. So I got close with two of my teachers, well, three of my teachers from there, and then they helped me out with stuff like that as well. So pretty much they helped me get all my GCSEs, because I didn't start um, practicing for my GCSEs until Christmas. Then they helped me get all my GCSEs and stuff like that. And well, if you show your social worker and yacht worker and that like, you teach them that respect, then they'll show you your back. So, it works in both ways, to be honest, and your teachers and your yacht works and not always want you to stop what you're doing because they want to see you like being good and stuff like that, have a good future. In August 2019, when we set up the Violence Reduction Unit, we were seeing serious violence not only on our streets, uh, but also on social media. There was so much content out there that was glamorising gang culture and creating opportunities for exploitation of young people and even inciting serious violence on our streets. For many young people, that has become normalised. It's our role as a VRU and as a multi-agency partnership to challenge that normalisation and to support young people into more positive pathways and offer them alternatives. As a VRU, we combat knife crime and we combat serious violence and we increase um, protective factors for young people by commissioning projects to support them right through a life course. This can be um, diversionary activities, therapeutic interventions, mentoring interventions, all of which that will um, allow them to achieve more positive outcomes and allow them to thrive as individuals and as community members. During 2020-21 and, and in the three years preceding that, we've actually seen a reduction in knife crime in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. But it's important to say that we absolutely cannot be complacent. The public health approach is long term. This is about making significant change to a generation of children and young people so we can break the cycle of violence and exploitation. We will continue to work with partners in education, in police, in health, to drive forward system change, which tackles some of the issues that have been mentioned in this documentary.